Wall Street Unplugged looks beyond the regular headlines heard on mainstream financial media to bring you unscripted interviews and breaking commentary direct from Wall Street right to you on Main Street. How's it going out there? It's May 13th. I'm Frank Kersey, host of the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, why I break down headlines and... Tell you what's really moving these markets. So the lockdown in Florida is officially over. Not that we were really on a lockdown anyway. And I live in northern Florida, closer to the Georgia border. South, Palm Beach, different places. Yes, they were on lockdown a little bit more than we were. But now restaurants are open. We could eat inside as long as you're practicing social distancing, which they took out a lot of tables. Hair salons are opening up, I think, next week. It was supposed to open up this week. I think they push it until next week. UFC, if you sport fans, one of the only sports that are going on right now, I believe, outside of in China, since on ESPN you're seeing highlights of baseball in China with nobody in the stands. Doesn't get better than that. <laughs> but UFC, UFC matches are being fought in Jacksonville. Look at that lines around my neighborhood. They're pretty long, especially for fast food, things like Starbucks, anything with a drive through and beaches are now open. People are just dying to get outside. I mean, in Florida, they're not dying to get back to work. This is Florida. Remember, that's different. And I called three different people to, to do work on my house over the past three weeks, and all three of them didn't show up. Three for three. It still surprises me. It still surprises I can't get over that. Like, I just – I can't. I, it, it's the way it is. You know when something's the way it is and you're supposed to get used to it? I just – I don't know why I just can't get used to it. We could get the New York Academy where people would fight for jobs like that. And these are big jobs. I mean, $700 to $1,000 jobs. I knew my trees trim, which are terrible right now. It's just, you know, landscaping, things done in the house. And, you know, replacing the windows since they're really old. It's just like big jobs. People are like, yeah, I'll be there. They're not, I just, I don't know. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. I don't know. It's crazy. Anyway, I say this all the time. If you have kids that hate to work, send them to Florida. Best place to live. Anyway. Looking at our lockdown, I have to say, I wish the lockdown was still in place where I live. I am right off the bat, I'm driving to work about, it's only about a five minute drive. And I usually stop at Starbucks and grab my tea. Yes, make fun of me. I'm a tea guy. Thank my mom for that. <laughs> now coffee. But I pull out of my complex and now there's more people out. And, and there's a stop sign, but you can't see the road unless you pull in front of the stop sign. So everybody stops the stop sign and then inches up. But there's like a walkway there across, you know, for, for the street. So I'm inching up, inching up, inching up, and people are – you can't see it because it's like trees on both sides. So I'm inching up, and then I finally see my stop, and you know it's like a 70-year-old couple. And they just stop right in front of my car and look at me and just shake their head. <laughs> they just shit like, what was I supposed to do? I'm not going to hit you. I got to move up. I got to see if cars are coming before I go. But right off the bat, it gets right back to normal. And this is you know, okay, just people walking by. And remember, I'm in my car for about five minutes, give it 10 minutes, waiting on the Starbucks line. Because there's a short stretch that I go on to that has two lanes. So it has two lanes in each direction. And again, this is like right after – a day after lockdown. And some lady's drive completely cuts me off. And sometimes that happens. That's fine. But of course, no blinker, no nothing. I mean sometimes, look, you're in your blind spot, whatever, I get it. It happens to all of us. No. Completely cuts me off. Doesn't even know. Doesn't even know. Right? So then I, I pull up to her at the light. And I look at her, and she's on her phone talking, and she just looks over, and she's probably in her 60s. She just looks over, and she shakes her head at me. Like, you know, like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm just looking at it going, are you kidding me? I mean, is this for real? And then as I'm pulling into Starbucks, of course, which, again, I do a lot. I like Starbucks. Love it. But I pull into the drive through and I'm about to just get online, and some guy rushes and cuts me off. Like, badly cuts me off. Not like, you know, you're both coming in from different sides and it's kind of even. Like, the guy saw me hit his and cut me off. Like, like, I was just, I'm like, man, I have to tell you, I, I'm losing patience here. I'm, I'm probably going to move. I just don't like the environment for my kids. But, man, people talk about New Yorkers and being mean. You're crazy. I've lived there all my life. People will help you. I'll do anything for you. They're impatient. Yes, it's fast paced. But here, man, it's just people are angry and I mean, it's always been like that. Maybe it's more uh, because people have been home and they're losing patience. I don't know. But it is pretty crazy. But I'd like to hear from you as well. I said, you know, I, I 
joke around about Florida, but it's no joke. This, these are real stories. When my friends come here, they laugh, they listen to the podcast, and they're like, oh, that's a funny story, and they're here for a week. They're like, oh, my God. Everything you say is absolutely true. I said, I'm not kidding. It's, it's just it's weird here. But that's here. Now, states are opening up one by one slowly, which is good news for stocks until Tuesday. So on Tuesday, the Nasdaq did something really, really, really unusual. It went down. <laughs> I know it's crazy. Nasdaq, technology stocks, they went down and going up like every single day for five weeks outside of a few day periods. That's it. But it went down alongside the rest of the markets, a little bit more than the markets. And that's surprising these days, considering on Friday after, not before, but after we reported, right? The worst job number on record, 20 and a half million American workers lost their job. The unemployment rate is, is close to 20%. I don't think we've seen almost ever since the 30s. And it says 14 and a half. It's not including furlough employees that may come back. I mean, there's just so many different things that are trying to sugarcoat these numbers. They're terrible. They're terrible. And now we'll look at an earnings season where we're halfway through. So I have a lot of big names are going to report this week, next week. But the new consensus, since they're reporting, the new consensus earnings for 2020 for the S&P 500, they're in. And that number is $127. Now, what does that mean? It means all the earnings combined for the S&P 500, if you combine them all, all of them, full earnings for the year, for 2020, all together, they're expected to generate $127. That number was $175 in January. So that's a decline of close to 30%. And that may be conservative because... Half the company, well, 50% of the S&P 500 right now, and you still have a lot of companies to report, have removed their guidance. Removed their guidance. So analysts are speculating, oh, all right, maybe we'll see, based on what you reported this quarter, what you're saying about next quarter, Q2, we'll figure out, okay, maybe a 10% decline. Fit. No, this is with the 30% decline. That's what they're expecting. So based on that number, the S&P 500 is trading at 24 times forward earnings. 20-year average is 16 and a half. I would say it should be trading more like seven, I'd say 18, 18 and a half, because the 20 year average does not include low interest rates, favorable tax structure. You got to throw that in, right? You're going to see earnings much higher because they're paying lower corporate taxes. And also, you have more debt being issued, especially this week. Holy cow. I mean, Disney, everybody. I've seen more secondary offerings of debt offered just in the last couple of days than I've seen, right? Their stock prices are higher. Hey, smart. We're overvalued. This is the time to do it. This is when you want to raise money, when your stock's overvalued, right? You want to issue more shares. Who cares what the stock does after that? You just raise all that money at your share price a lot higher. And you're seeing that like crazy. But at the valuation right now is close to a 20-year high, 24 times forward earnings. Now, what does that mean? It means we have a market surging higher while earnings are crashing. Hey. You guys, I'm hoping that, that you've learned as much from me as I've learned from you since I've been doing this podcast for 12 years. Can you send me research on any other time you've seen that? Ever? A market surging while earnings are crashing? Think about that. I mean, earnings really started coming down in 2007 before 2008. Crash. We saw earnings coming down for everything. If you look, go back to the tech bubble. Earnings and sales were growing. Hey, we got crazy expensive into March 2000, but you know, before the dot-com crash, earnings were growing. They should have been growing much, much faster to justify those valuations, but earnings were growing. Sales were growing. Usership, people, more, people using the internet were growing while stock prices were ramping higher before it crashed. Today, that's not the case. I mean, at that 125 earnings number for the S&P 500, Again, this is assuming a 30% decline, and it could be optimistic. It could be optimistic because a lot of these companies are pulling their guidance, and everyone's expecting things to be okay by year end. They threw away the V-shaped recovery. I don't know if it's going to be V-shaped, W, whatever, pick whatever, whatever you want. Now they're like, well, I don't think anybody believes that this. I heard that on CNBC today. Someone said, I don't think anybody believes that this is going to be a V-shaped recovery. Well, that's what everybody's been saying for the past Three months since this happened. The V shapes come right back. It's coming right back. The numbers don't suggest that. Companies are telling you that it's not going to happen. Yet the market, is it that forward looking? Let's talk about that for a minute.
because I'm just talking about the S&P 500 here. The S&P 500 trading at 24 times forward earnings. That's nothing, nothing compared to the NASDAQ 100, the largest technology companies in the world, which is now trading pretty close to 30 times forward earnings. And to put that in perspective, it's been close to 20 years since we've seen this type of valuation on tech stocks in the tech bubble. But at 29 times forward earnings, that's based on 2020 estimates, right? And I get it. 2020 is a throwaway. Where f I'll get, I'll, I'll jump on that bandwagon. Whatever. 2020 is a wash. All the CEOs, when they're reporting, should say, "Look, we're removing guidance. We have no idea what's going on, and we're all going on vacation. And your stock's going to go higher right now. That's the market we're in. Can't control it. Doesn't matter. They report one positive thing, and everything else is a disaster. Remove guidance. We don't know what's going on." Stocks going like that because 2020 is nothing because this is going to go back to normal in 2021, right? So none of this stuff exists. Pretend 2020 never even existed, okay? I just beat that to death. I know. But there's a reason why. Because when we look at 2021, and let's look at that for a minute. So the 29 times forward earnings, which we are today, which the NASDAQ 100 is trading at 22 times forward earnings, mid-February, pre-coronavirus, when things were great before all this stuff really, really started spreading the U.S. But let's take a closer look at basically the largest member in the NASDAQ 100, depending on what day. Sometimes it's Microsoft, but it's Apple. And I've talked about Apple before. I'm not trashing Apple here at all. I just want to explain something to you, why this is important. Because right now we're trading at levels that 2020 doesn't exist and 2021 is going to be fine. There's no one that could disagree with that. That's what we're trading at. That's what everybody believes. That's where the market is. If you listen to CBC, you listen to consensus, you listen to analysts, that's what they believe. Forget about what you believe. Forget about what I believe. Forget about Main Street. That's the consensus. That's what they believe. 2021 is going to be great. Not just great. It's going to be better than pre-coronavirus because that's what we're trading at. We're trading high evaluations. So when I look at Apple in January, pre-coronavirus, stick with me. I'm just going to give you a couple numbers, and this is important. I'm taking Apple on purpose because it's the biggest company. So pre-coronavirus, Apple's estimates, they're expected to earn $14.60 this year, 2020, and $16.25 in 2021. So solid growth expected. Again, pre-coronavirus, 5G phone coming out, service revenue starting to really ramp up. I get it. Today, today, Apple is projected to earn $12.20 for 2020. Again, that's down from $14.60. Throw that out. Let's throw that out, right? 2020 doesn't exist. But in 2021, you know what the consensus estimate is? It's $14.50. So pre-coronavirus, it was $16.25. Now it's $14.50. Let's throw this in perspective. Put the, all this in perspective here. Since everyone believes 2021, things are going to go back to normal, right? But in January, Apple traded $300 a share and was projected to generate $16.25 in earnings for 2021. Today, Apple is trading at $315 a share, 5% higher, just 3% off its all-time high. Yet earnings for 2021, again, not 2020, it's a wash, are only expected to come in at $1,450. So we have a stock price that's surging while earnings growth is slowing considerably. So the market is trading right now based on valuation – I mean, even if it was trading at 21, 22 times earnings, it would be, but you know, the NASDAQ 100 at, at 30 times and the market at 24 times, it's assuming that Apple should be generating not just 16, 25 a share, which was your pre January numbers, that it should be closer to $17 a share in 2021. That's what we're trading today. And it's not the case. And I'm taking the biggest stock on purpose. I'm not telling you to sell Apple. I'm not telling you to go crazy. Whatever. I mean, tech stocks are going higher. There's a bid under them. There's money just being pushed into, the, into that sector. But at these valuations where you're seeing earnings growth, is not, it's not going to return back to where it was pre-coronavirus until after 2021. And that is definitely not factored in. If you're looking at it, I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers, which you need to know if, you, if you know, the numbers are hard to follow, I get it. Just understand that the market is trading as 2021 is going to be business as usual, yet earnings for all of these companies, almost none of them are expected to be 
I won't say none of them, but probably about 80%, even the technology companies, those earnings are not going to be much higher than they were in 2019 pre-coronavirus. Some of them, but not all of them. And that's pretty crazy when you think about it. Again, earnings drive stock prices usually, usually, not in today's market. It doesn't matter. You move guidance, your stock's going higher. It's better for you. But eventually, that's going to matter. And now the consensus earnings is really coming in, and you're looking at 2021 with these analyst estimates and how low they are. I mean, Apple is trading at 22 times 2021 estimates. One of its highest valuations ever, and we're not even we're throwing away 2020 now. That's how crazy the market is. I mean, it's unbelievable. I said two weeks ago, this is the most dangerous market I've seen in my career, which is my career is probably half as long as Stanley Drunken Metal, Miller, who just said – and he's a legendary billionaire hedge fund manager. He was speaking at the Economic Club New York. It was an event this week. I think it was virtual. But he said the risk reward for equities is maybe as bad as I've ever seen it in my career. And the V-shaped recovery is a fantasy. And this follows legends like Paul Tudor Jones, uh, Jeffrey Gunlap, Paul Singer. Uh, these are the best of the best. These guys aren't like Ackman that are, you know, use TV for their own benefit and just, you know, I won't say pretend to cry or whatever. What a joke, you know, because to, to, for his positions, no, these, these, these are not the same guys. And these are legends saying, guys, watch out where they're not going to do as well if the market does come down. They're fully invested in this stuff. They're not, you know, go short and just let me go on TV. No, these guys don't care. They're billionaires. They're rich. I mean, Ackman doesn't. Some others will, will use the media, but not these guys. These guys are like, look, you know, risk reward Buffett sitting in $100 billion in cash, is it? Can't find any ideas. How is that possible with this market? I mean, you're looking at, I understand technology. I understand you're looking at the SP 500. I know you're looking at the NASDAQ that's up. The NASDAQ's up this year. But look at industrials. Look at energy. Look at banks. Look at airlines. Travel. And Buffett's saying, none of that is worth my time right now. I, and Buffett's looking out 10 years. He's not saying, wow, this is a great opportunity. Let's buy it right now. We could leverage this and sell it two years from now like private equity. No. He's saying, even if I buy right now, 10 years from now, I don't see the value in this. I mean, to say this is going to be a V-shaped recovery, I take Disney, for example. I'm not look, Disney just raised more debt today. I, I'm not going to – you guys know how I feel about Disney. It's it'll probably going to continue to go higher even though – more leverage than ever. Crazy because you have Broadway just said they're not opening up till after Labor Day. That that's September. That's September. I mean, but you look at Disney, which their whole business is based on crowds and families, and I mean, they opened up Shanghai thirty percent capacity. Great, they sold out right away. That's awesome. Disney will never have its parks at a hundred percent capacity again. They can't. They don't have the room because you're going to have to practice social distancing for at least three years. Maybe law people are still going to be, you know, kind of paranoid about stuff like this. And I'm just saying if the coronavirus goes away this year, we don't see it spread again with states opening up. But you're creating more separation between lines, whether it's three feet in Asia or six feet here. So you're gonna have fewer people in that park. That means if I had a guess for Disney for their parks, they have to be at least at 70% capacity before they make money with expenses, employees, all this electricity. I mean, just uh leases, it, the amount of money it costs to run that park, and then everything over 70% is gravy. Well, you're never going to get back to 100% today, which is a fact, because you're cutting back. You, you're creating more space in between people, which means you're going to have a capacity. Debt limit's going to come down. If it was a million people that go into parks, it's probably going to be like 800,000 that can go in now with social distancing. Otherwise, everyone's going to be on top of each other. Does that mean things are going to go back to normal? Look at Los Angeles, Hollywood. And Los Angeles said that they extended its stay-at-home orders for another three months, basically three months through July. Holy cow. And Disney's very tied to Hollywood and their movies. Again, I'm just using Disney as an example. So I get it. I get 2020 is a wash. But earnings projections for 2021, not 2020, 2021, are lower than they were in January pre-coronavirus. And I don't get that. Because we're trading as not as everything's going to get back to normal, which we know is not, that things are going to be much, much better.
much, much better. Now, what factors? I'm throwing in the Fed printing over $4 trillion already. Got Pelosi and, and another $5 trillion stimulus that she's ready to send to the Senate. Maybe it goes to four trillion or whatever before it passes. What's five trillion? Nothing. I, I love these people. <laughs> I mean, politics. It must be great to be a politician because it doesn't matter. You don't have checks and balances. You don't have to make sure. You know, it doesn't. In my business, if we don't generate money and I can't pay employees, we go bankrupt, right? For that, it's just constant money where we could spend on whatever. That's why they crave the power so much because it. I mean, even if it doesn't work out for you, if you get elected and you're horrible, you're making a million dollars as soon as you come out just from your connections on Wall Street. Wall Street will hire you, right? Uh, look at all the Fed, past Fed chairmen. They're all freaking making three to $10 million a year working for the PIMCOs and whatever, right? Bond company, whatever. Consulting and make a fortune. I mean, coming a politician is awesome because you could spend as much money as you want. They want that money's going to be used to bail out the post office. It was $5 billion. It's probably going to be 7 to $10 billion, $12 billion. Don't worry. Just keep it open. Forget about trying to figure it out and run it like a business. Forget about that. Just throw money at it. We'll be fine. It's okay. Another five trillion. Five trillion, guys. We're talking about close to ten trillion dollars. I mean, a trillion is not going to be enough to bail out the states. The states are all bankrupt. There's no revenue coming in. And they're spending money and supplies and everything. There's no money coming in for the states right now. Because nobody's working. What's the tax the tax dollars? Nothing's coming in. Yeah, some people are still getting paid, but still other things, most of the money, these companies are, are just bankrupt. I mean, the companies with their states, these states are bankrupt. A trillion dollars you think is going to be good enough for them? Are you crazy? I mean, New York is going to take half of that, at least, by itself. So, yes, I'm factoring in trillions coming to this market. The government's going to start buying high-yielding debt securities through ETFs. But you have to remember, some of the negatives, guys, is buybacks – are gone. That's what was a huge driver of the market for the last six years, at least six years. And you look at the numbers, they're going from, from 800 billion, 900 billion, it's supposed to be a trillion dollars in buybacks. This was the main reason to buy back. That's why banks are getting crushed. I mean, I recommend Citigroup, we did fantastic on it, sold it before coronavirus. But my thesis was based on they were buying back 30% of their float over three years, and they were going to increase their dividend. It was like $12, 15 $20 billion, I think. It was $20 billion over the next two years, $30 billion in total. That they were just, It was just for shareholders. I was like, Citigroup doesn't have to do anything, and the stocks are going to go higher based on that. And it did. It started going higher. But now banks aren't allowed to issue dividends, and buybacks are gone. There's a reason why they're getting destroyed. And they make a lot of money when interest rates are higher and interest rates are low. M&A activity for investment banks is kind of shut down. Yeah, you see Grubhub and a couple here and there, but not many. So buybacks, a, a big fuel for these stocks is gone. It's the reason why Apple made their quarter so many times. They, they're just buying back tons of stock. Good for them. They have the best balance sheet in the world. But it's gone. I mean, Apple's going to continue to buy. Do you want them to buy 22 times, 23 times forward earnings, 2021 earnings? Not really. I think that $50 billion, you could do a lot more with that. We're also seeing consumer demand shrink, record unemployment. GDP is going to be down 25 30%, numbers we haven't seen since 1930. So very, very rare, guys, very, very rare. If ever have we seen stocks surge in the face of a monumental collapse in earnings. Are there good ideas out there? Of course. There's sectors that are still getting destroyed. I mean, most of this is a tech boom. But most stocks are overvalued. Now, I don't know when this market's going to come down. It could be next month. I don't know. Sell and may go away. Who knows? It could be three months, 12 months. But this can't be sustained the way it is. I mean, you want to buy technology stocks at these insane valuations when their earnings estimates are going to be lower in 2021 than they were projected to be pre-coronavirus? Because I was under the impression 2021 was going to go back to normal. Everything's going to be great. Do you want to buy these in the face of zero growth from Europe? Europe accounts for lots of profits for these companies. The growth engine, a lot of companies in the U.S., 30% of earnings come from overseas. You got massive slowdown in growth in China, which was seeing a slowdown in China already. Not only with possible trade wars heating up again, which this time it's for real. It's not just back and forth and who's got the bigger you know what. No, this is for real now. This is going to hurt growth. 
So I'm not including any of those risks at all, and I'm not even including the coronavirus, where we could see it start spreading again as each state opens up their economies. I'm not even counting that risk. So from a risk rewards perspective, man, you have to be careful. You have to be willing to change your thesis or get out of stocks when things start turning. Because when they turn, it's going to get very, very bad. And you're looking to, you know, guys, analyze Home Depot. Home Depot is a stock in our portfolio we're up 20% on. I have 14, there's 30 analysts that cover the stock. Really quick, 30 analysts that cover the stock. 18 have a buy rating. They report on Monday. Out of those 18, 14 have a buy rating, right? The 18 have a buy rating, but 14 of those that have the buy rating have a target price that's lower than what Home Depot is currently trading. Explain that to me. You have a buy rating on a stock with a target that's lower. All right, fine. Maybe earnings come out good, but what's the upside on Home Depot? For me, I'm struggling. What is it, 5 10%? If things don't go well, it could come down a ton because it's trading at 22, 23 times forward earnings. Maybe these stocks go high, but the risk reward has never been greater. I mean, you're seeking returns and taking an enormous amount of risk to do it in most, in most of these stocks, not all of them. Sorry for the gloomy outlook. I just tell you how I see it. I have no agenda here. Now, this week's guest is going to give you an amazing perspective, and it's going to come from Italy because that's where I'm interviewing him. You should be familiar with this name now. This person has come on my podcast. This is in mid-March on lockdown in Italy, and he's still on lockdown. Italy's finally easing restrictions very, very slowly, but they are, and his name is Ed Carr. So as the CEO of U.S. Gold Corp., he founded several investment management firms, investment banking firms in, in Europe, uh, active in natural resource industry for years. 2004, Future Magazine named uh, Carr one of the world's top traders. He worked for Prudential. He's been in the financial service industry for over 25 years. He knows about economics. He travels the world. Very, very smart individual. And last time he was on, he gave us a great picture of what was taking place in Italy since they went on lockdown two weeks ahead of us funny because we're ending our lockdown in most states. Well, Italy, Italy's still being cautious. Italy's still being cautious. They want lockdown before us and they're still a lockdown. We're opening up. And let me tell you something. You're going to hear this in a minute. Italy's lockdown is a real lockdown. Europe, China, those are real lockdowns. And when the government says something, you do it. Here, the government says it and you got reporters just yelling at the president and everybody is smarter than everybody else here. Everybody's a teacher, a doctor, the U.S., you know. Freedom is really cool, but sometimes you're like, wow, I just wish some person said, this is what you have to do, and you do it, <laughs> because everybody's kind of doing what they want right now, which isn't a bad thing, but if you're looking at every place else that locked down, and when they went on lockdown, they really went on lockdown. They weren't out of the houses at all. Yeah, everybody's out, and we're going back. It's a great chance for it to spread in the U.S. than it is for these other countries. So it's a great follow-up interview. Please listen carefully. It's going to say a lot of great stuff that you could use and that I'm using to the point where you could see what's happening in Italy and what's potentially going to happen in the US. So when I look at Ed Carr, it's because contacts like this, which I have all around the world, thanks to you guys listening to this podcast, incredibly smart, decades of experience, finance economists, have zero bias. It's helped me bring you the news ahead of mainstream media. And through this video, it's going to be a little echoey, which of course, we're doing it through Skype, but you're going to be able to hear everything. Usually, it's better, better quality, but trust me, it'll be fantastic. And let's get to interview with my buddy, Ed Carr, right now. Ed Carr, thanks so much for joining us on Wall Street Unplugged. Hey, Frank, great to be back. Thanks for having me. No, nah, it's great. It's great. So the last time we did this, right, I interviewed you, and it was mid-March. Yeah. This was when... You were on lockdown, I think it was since March 9th. We were not on lockdown yet. New York officially went on lockdown on the 20th, yeah. but the rest of the country hasn't really been on lockdown like Italy. Uh, it, it's two months later, and you're starting to open up your economies. You're seeing rates finally come down. We're seeing them come down a little bit. You've seen them come down a lot when it comes to infections and also deaths. Yeah. Talk about the environment there, what's going on right now, now that you're just starting to open up. Sure. So... As you know, Frank, I'm, I'm in Florence, Italy, in Tuscany. Um, the hardest hit area of Italy was more the north, around Milan and Lombardy. Um, but the, the, the reason why Italy locked down so strongly and countrywide, I think as we discussed in the last time, was the country was really on the verge of a healthcare industry collapse. 
no more ICU beds available, literally no hospital beds available, you know, a number of new cases spiking up, deaths spiking. So they had to lock everyone down and that was successful. Here we are, and I don't know, but if we're even on week eight or nine of lockdown, they kind of all meld together, you know, after a while. Um, I think we're on week nine now. So the lockdown has actually controlled the you know, amount of new cases. The transmission has declined precipitously. We're seeing very, very good news. There hasn't been a lot of new cases. Um, the curve is really declining and the amount of deaths is really declining as well. So that's very positive. Now the Italian government here in mid-May is starting to ease up just a little bit on that lockdown. So they're starting with industrial factories we all know that the economic implications of this lockdown have been catastrophic. And for Italy, the economy was weaker than the United States going into this pandemic. The lockdown has just been like a nuclear bomb going off. So they need to get the factories open. They're starting with a little bit of construction workers, but everything else is still pretty locked down. You know, it's very selective on restaurants, cafes, takeout only. Now you can actually leave your property. You have to have a mask on and you can go visit some relatives, go get some exercise. So this is all new, but you can't just travel. You can't go to the beach. You know, you're definitely not going to a, to a soccer game anytime soon. Now talk about the lockdown uh, in terms of the restrictions that you had, because I want to compare it to what we have in the U.S. Because in the U.S., as you know, uh, yes, the free country of the world, but it also results in everybody thinks they're a doctor, everybody thinks they're a teacher, everybody knows more than everybody else. Sometimes it's nice to be someone tell you this is what you have to do. Yeah. We don't really have that. We kind of do whatever we want here, even though things are on lockdown. New York was the toughest lockdown. I mean, that was as close to a lockdown as you can get. But even at New York, when I look at Italy, could you talk about the restrictions in place? Were there military in the street, not to the point where it was scary, but just enforcing yeah. this. Do you see people with masks when you went into grocery right. stores where they take, take your temperature? What was included in that lockdown? I just want to compare it to what's included in ours because we're opening up our economy even faster right. than yours. And our lockdown started later than you, which is a little scary. Right. And the answer, Frank, is yes, all of the above. It was a real lockdown here in Italy. So everyone was confined to quarters. You were not supposed to leave your property unless to go to the supermarket for food shopping, the pharmacy, or a medical emergency. Once you left your property, you had to have a mask. Most people put on gloves as well. You had to respect two meters, six feet social distancing, and it was rigorously enforced. There were a lot of police officers out. There was military out. You know, a lot of the teenagers think they're Superman and invincible, so they might take a little music, go to the park and have an impromptu techno party. And they all were fined, you know, very severely, 500 euro fines. Um, the cops were out all the time. I went out and walked my dog on our street, which is almost a countryside street. The cops pulled me over. They asked me where I lived, where I was going. I had a dog, so I had an official reason why I could go be outside my property. But yeah, they, they were pretty stringent here, really, really trying to keep everyone inside. And ultimately, you know, Italy was on the verge of that healthcare system collapsing. So it was a real national emergency. So health healthcare, you're looking at healthcare um, system almost collapsing. You're looking at at also Italy itself was a disaster pretty much pre-coronavirus. So not just Italy, a lot of Europe was close to a recession, whatever. It's defined as two trade quotas negative GDP. I mean, the top five economies were growing basically at like 0.2, 0.1, even negative 0.1. So it was kind of like a recession already. How is Italy uh, on the stimulus side dealing with this? And is it going to be enough? Because we were coming from a base where we were much stronger. Uh, and now you're seeing our market come back, which we'll get to in a minute. But with Italy, things were pretty bad going in. Banks were not fully capitalized. What are you seeing now? Like, How are they going to stimulate the economy in terms of us? We spend trillions of dollars like it's, you know, do you take that? A dollar out of your pocket. What yeah. is Italy doing to stimulate their economy? Look, Frank, it, it, you're exactly right. The the economy of Italy has basically been flatline GDP since 2009, the Great Financial Recession. So no growth since uh, 2009. So they were in a weaker position going into this pandemic. Had a stronger lockdown. Now recently, they've approved a 740 billion euro stimulus package. 
um, from the Italian state government, uh, but it's going via the Italian banks. And this is a country of a lot of bureaucracy. You know, Italy changes their government like most people change their underwear. So every six months, they get a new government here since World War II. A lot of bureaucracy. It has not been as smooth and as easy as the United States. You go get the SBA or the PPP loans, and a lot of people can apply through their local banks. And the United States, with good technology, bang, in a week, your, your loan is approved. Here in Italy, it's not like that at all. So I tell you, Frank, a lot of people are hurting and hurting badly. Let's take, for example, Florence, the town that I live in. This is a tourist town. Well, we don't have any tourists. There are tens of thousands of restaurants, cafes, bars, museums, hotels, Airbnb. That entire industry downtown has been gutted. You know, I, I estimate, Frank, that at least 50% of those bars, restaurants, hotels, Airbnb will all go bankrupt. You know, they're not going to get the loans out to the people in time. This is a liquidity cash flow issue. When you have a, a pizzeria, a restaurant, your rent does not stop. Even though you've laid off your employees, you still have to pay the rent, you still have to pay the electricity. And if you can't get these loans, at some point you have to throw up your hands and say, basta, you know, sorry, bankruptcy. So I think it's going to be devastating for the Italian economy. Now, what are you seeing from uh, the people perspective, consumer perspective? Is there civil unrest? Is there people, again, for us, small business loans, uh, it, it's crazy to the point where almost anyone could get them, no matter what business. I mean, Harvard was getting them, Shake Shack was getting them, then they gave them back for all the backlash and stuff. But yeah, you know, I mean, here it, it's a little different because, you know, the unemployment benefits, they're making more money than when they worked, which is insane when you think about it. But right. what are you seeing with yours? Because even from our side, we're seeing frustration from people, frustration for small business owners. And we'll get to the US economy in a second. But I'm curious to see with those small businesses really struggling here, you could say, well, we're not going to pay rent. The government will probably take care of you uh, and, and pay that fee at some time or, you know, the REITs or whatever it filters down to. But what are you seeing on that side? Are people angry? Are you seeing more and more people worried? Uh, you know, I'm just curious to see that that part of the environment, the people part yeah. of the environment. Yeah, and I tell you, Frank, it's a great point, great observation. Civil unrest is definitely increasing. And personally, that's one of my biggest worries because, you know, the, the people that are watching your show, your podcast, subscribe to your newsletters, they have some net worth. They're out in the financial markets. They probably own stocks and bonds and have some cash. As we all know, this pandemic hit the lower uh, economic income of the population the worst. So it's the people that live paycheck to paycheck, you know, the waitress at a restaurant that lost her job, who's a single mom. Now she has no job, can't pay the rent, can barely put food on the table. And in Italy, this has always been a country where people have been very kind, courteous, civil, very Catholic, you know, oriented country, homogenous. We've seen a lot of anger um, down south when you start getting down towards Napoli, you know, definitely in Sicily. There has been organized riots by some of the, the Italian mafia really trying to stir people up. In fact, they went with, you know, iron bars and they broke into a Carrefour supermarket because the people didn't have enough food. And a lot of people in the south of Italy, they're all working black. So, you know, they're, they're not paying taxes. All these jobs are gone and they can't even uh, get unemployment benefits because they were never declared in the first place. So we're definitely seeing civil unrest starting to increase. And I think, Frank, that's one of our biggest black swans. It's going to increase even more in the future. See, those are the stories we're not reading here. Riots and, you know, organized riots and stuff. We're not hearing that at all, which is which is pretty crazy. But let's move to the United States now. Uh, you have 25 years background investment banking and financial services, U.S. Gold Corp president CEO. So, you know, you have you understand our markets and you travel the world. Uh you, you have to under, see what's going on with our economy where there's such a major disconnect. We're seeing GDP numbers, unemployment numbers not seen since the Great Depression. And people say, well, it's temporary. Everything's going to go back to normal soon, which it's not going to go back to normal soon. I mean, it, it really isn't. Uh, well, you're telling people that there's you, you can't be next to each other. It, it's going to have big consequences. It's going to take a lot longer than expected. But with that said, we're seeing a stock market that has jumped incredibly to the point where the Nasdaq's actually up this year. Yeah. From your experience, how do you explain that disconnect? Uh, it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling, Frank. You know, it really is. And when we look at it, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, 
I, I think when they write the history books, when we're sitting down with our future grandchildren, you know, when, when Jesus Christ was born, we have BC, you know, time scale before Christ and then AD, basically after Christ. We're going to have BC and AC, before Corona, after Corona. You know, it's, it, I don't think we ever go back to normal. Normal is going to be the stories we tell our grandchildren that, yeah, we used to ride the subway in New York City, and we used to go to Times Square for New Year's Eve with millions of other people. <laughs> we'd go to a Yankees game and eat a hot dog, and then we jump on the plane and we fly down to Miami for the weekend, and our grandchildren are going to look at us like, what? You know, it's, <laughs> it's never going back to that, Frank. You know, it's just not. And I so, say I say the same stories with my kids today that yeah. you used to smoke in hospitals and planes and nobody wore a seatbelt when I was a kid. You just exactly. jumped in the back. It's kind of crazy. Right. But yeah, yeah. Yep. So it's it's never going back. And there'll be this new normal. The world will get used to it, we'll persevere, we'll overcome, and we will get through this. You know, ultimately, I'm bullish on the spirit of the human race. However, the market, Frank, is way ahead of itself. I mean, it's absolutely insane that we bounced back up and now the NASDAQ's positive for the year. We have the highest unemployment rates ever, and that only went through mid-April of 14.4%. We're probably going to go 20 to 25% unemployment, maybe 30 before the thing's all done. You know, it will be probably a 20% hit to GDP. And a lot of these jobs, Frank, are not coming back. And I'll tell you why. Crowd psychology changes. Just ask yourself, Frank, would you take your family right now to a ball game, you know, with 50,000 other people? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I just, no. why take the risk, you know? Are you going to go, I mean, on the subway right now in New York City, if you could afford to take an Uber? I probably wouldn't, you know? I wouldn't take mass transit if I could avoid it. So am I going to go into a crowded restaurant when maybe I could get Uber Eats? So there'll certainly be winners and losers, but I think a lot of these you know, jobs, take New York City alone, probably half the restaurants there are going to go bankrupt. They really will. So, you know, with, with this economic Armageddon of, you know, bad information, why is the stock market rallying so much? Well, two words, Federal Reserve. They're on the bid. They're buying everything through all this stimulus. The Fed actually today, Frank, is going to start through BlackRock buying junk bonds. The first time in the history of the United States, the Fed junk usually bonds. buys investment grade or even government bonds. Now they're buying junk bonds and they're going across the board. They're buying ETFs. When they buy an ETF, a rising tide lifts all boats. So this massive amount, this tsunami of stimulus money has plowed its way into the capital markets. And I think the Fed and the government wants this because you have this psychological wealth effect. When people look at their 401k IRA statement and they see that, hey, I'm actually positive or flat for the year, it's not that bad. Maybe we mm -hmm. should get that new car or go to Walt Disney World. If you look at your 401k statement, you're down 30, 40%, oh, you hold off on making any big purchase. So I think that they're trying to stimulate the markets, but personally, I think it's way ahead of itself and it's probably gonna have another leg down. And you know, what's gonna trigger that leg down? So we're gonna get to the Fed, which is something that you know you, you predicted that, and I want to get to it, but what's, what's the trigger here? Because you know when I see these money flows and I see the government, and we'll get to it now, in fact, because yeah. you said last time I was on that, and this was mid-March, that the Fed needs to do everything to backstop this economy, right? Mm -hmm. Well. I know I, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. For me, I was agreeing, saying, okay, you know, we definitely have to backstop some of these industries. I didn't think it'd be in the tune of $3 trillion plus with more, more on the way. And you said that before the $2.2 trillion was announced, before you had the small business loan, which is you know, $500 million, and another two hundred and fifty right after that, like a week later, yep. right? It went so fast. Yep. But did you, did you think it'd be this excessive? And you know, that could lead to the other question I was going to ask you. you know, what's the trigger for this sell-off since the government just said whatever it takes and they're not going away anytime soon? Yeah, I did think it'd be this excessive. In fact, I think it'll be even more excessive. You know, the Fed, between the Fed and Congress right now, Frank, they've probably pumped in about $5.5 So that's a big number. However, if we have a 20% contraction of GDP, you know, they're going to have to spend $10 trillion just to get us back to zero. So already, Larry Kudlow said the White House is debating the third stimulus bill. And it's going to be like Rocky IV, Rocky V, Rocky VI, Stimulus 23. You know, like you say, they'll just keep going. At the end of the day, you can't fight the Fed, all that money coming in. However, I really believe there will be a point when the, the normal economics 
the earnings releases out of companies start to bring a little sanity to whether it's big hedge funds or other investors out there. And they start looking at this and saying, hey, wow, you know what? Disney World, who has streaming but also has theme parks, their earnings look pretty bad. Wow, look at how bad these other companies are. Wow, did you see that some big major oil companies really slash their dividend? Does everyone realize how bad the energy patch is right now? So mm -hmm. I think the, the economics and the fundamentals, you just can't stop them. And all this enthusiasm of the market, the NASDAQ, you know, going up being positive on the year. Ultimately, what my own thesis, Frank, is that, you know, it's a re-election year, as we all know. So it becomes political. President Trump wants to open the economy tomorrow so he can get jobs back. The economy starts ripping a little bit into November. People feel better and he gets the votes. The Democrats want the economy locked down as long as possible. So Joe Biden can go out and say, it was Trump. He was the bad guy. He didn't handle this situation well. Look at all these jobs that are destroyed. So you got a real political struggle. I personally think that governors and local areas will want to get the economy going. Um, I don't think they're going to manage it well, because personally, what I think they should do is keep the vulnerable people, the old people, or if you have pre-existing conditions, keep those people at home. You know, but guys like me that are 50 years old in good shape, guess what, Frank? I can get back to work. You know, I'm, I'm fine. I'm not really that worried. If I get it, it might even be mild. So I'd like to get back to work myself. But if we have this haphazard reopening, which is happening right now in the United States, there could be a second wave. You know, in the Spanish flu, 1918 to 1920, there were actually three waves. The second wave was the most deadly. That could happen now, you know, June, July, August with this reopening, you get this spike in a second wave. And then we get a third wave, maybe November, December, when it starts getting cold and flu season comes back in. So if you start getting these open close, open close, I think that could be really, really catastrophic for the for the markets overall, because the markets hate uncertainty. They do. They hate uncertainty. And right now, it's it's funny because the S&P 500 is even going, NASDAQ's going up, and the companies around 75% of them remove guidance. They're telling you, we have no idea what's going on. Right. That, just buy, buy, buy. And I get it with the Fed there behind it. But, you know, when we compare this market to say, you know, we want to compare it to something last time it was as bad as 2008, uh, 2009. Uh, and people say don't fight the Fed. And they were right. And I was one of those people. With, but earnings were, you know, S&P was trading at 11 times forward earnings. <laughs> yeah. The big difference today where we're trading at, at 22, 23 times forward earnings. You know, so it's interesting. Maybe that is a new norm. Maybe it's not, but like you said, it, it, I guess it is hard to fight, but it's just everything that you learn traditionally, especially for me, 25 years, buying a company at 23, 25 times forward earnings, or a company like Disney, 40 times forward earnings, that's not growing now and not growing next year. And this is going to significantly impact this company going forward. It, it's, I mean, as someone who, who was it, a finance guy and understands money management, how as a money manager do you go in and buy these stocks at these levels where extreme highest valuations you've ever seen yet they're not going to grow over the next 12 months and their earnings even through 2021 are going to be less than what they were pre-coronavirus yeah absolutely frank and i think any fundamental analyst that looks at this and runs the numbers realizes the market's getting way ahead of itself but what really brought the markets off the low of 2008 2009 and even now is all this computerized algorithmic trading and you know, a lot of these guys are just short-term trend followers, flash traders. And as the Fed goes in and starts buying all these ETFs, all of these algorithmic trading signals go on to buys, bang, and it just builds a you know self-perpetuating uh, upcycle. So it'll carry on until it doesn't. But there's entire industries that are going to be wiped out. I mean, who wants to go on a cruise? You know, do you really want to take a plane flight before there's a vaccine unless you have to? You know, again, major league sports stadiums, shopping malls, anything with large crowds. I think crowd psychology, people are going to be genuinely cautious and all those industries are going to be horrific going forward. It's not going to be a V-shaped recovery. You know, we're looking at either a U or probably an L for certain industries. OK, guys like Amazon and Netflix might be able to capitalize. But you're talking a very small segment of the market overall, you know? So I think we're way ahead of ourselves and we probably will have that next leg down. And guess what? You know, Frank, everyone knows the old saying in the markets, sell in May and go away. 
This is a perfect year for it, in my opinion. Yeah, I know. It, the markets have run up incredibly here. So what are the best plays here? We know the Fed's not going to stop spending, right? They're going to continue to back. They said whatever it takes. That's their words. Whatever it takes. And we're seeing whatever it takes. It doesn't matter. And they have the banks in, in Congress's ear saying, you know, not like last time where AIG was surprised. We had no idea they were backstopping everything. We had no idea how deep this was synthetic of synthetic of synthetic CDOs, the leverage. Yeah. Now we have the banks in the ear saying as soon as they're seeing a risk, they're telling the president. They're telling Congress, okay, what you know, high yield, high yield for me, CLO loans was a massive risk. And the banks actually went out there. That's why they buy they had to backstop that industry. Uh, you know, not that they had to, but it really would have collapsed the whole market. It's a massive industry. So my question is with the Fed spending, people are saying buy gold, buy Bitcoin. You're familiar with both of them. Obviously, present CEO of US Gold Corp, yep. uh, US based company. What are your thoughts on gold? Is it a layup here? Is Bitcoin a layup here, say, as a three to five year investment? Because it's not just here we're spending money, but it seems like this trend's not going to stop globally. Yeah, exactly. And that's a good point. You know, number one, this is not just a US phenomenon, this is international. You know, ECB, Bank of England, um, Bank of China, Bank of Japan, they are all just full throttle on the monetary stimulus. So the whole world. And they have to, Frank, they have to, or else we will have real civil unrest. You know, if half of the people in the world, 4 billion of the 8 billion people can't afford food, it's not going to be a nice planet to live on. So they've got to continue. They are locked in this trade. So, you know, what do we look at? I'm very, very bullish going forward on gold, Bitcoin, and any hard physical assets. Because ultimately, all central bankers and politicians can do is inflate. They hate deflation. They don't want to write off tons of debts. So they will inflate, inflate. They will print. They will print. They will print. They're going to continue to run the printing presses ad infinitum, which ultimately one day will debase the currencies. Now, that could take much longer than we think. It could take years and years and years for reserve currency like the U.S. dollar. But at some point, it will come. And when it comes, you could see something like gold, you know, go from current $1,700 an ounce on a super spike to thousands and thousands of dollars an ounce. And now, Frank, you know, we've got real credible people. You probably saw it just last week or the week before Bank of America, their analyst came out with a $3,000 gold price target. I mean, it's Bank of America. This isn't, uh, you know, conspiracytheory.com. This is a major credible bank with a $3,000 price target. So a lot of people are realizing that, you know, if you look at Zimbabwe, you look at Argentina, you look at Venezuela, countries that in the last 20 years have really run the printing presses, none of it ends well. It's a massive train wreck. And that's what's coming for us in the future. Let's end with this, because I think everybody is in agreement, which may be a contrarian indicator, which is a negative, but gold makes sense here. Talk about what gold does for a company like U.S. Gold, because we know, obviously, that the producers, the majors who all merge, just like the Exxons and the Mobiles merge. I mean, they're, they're giants now. Yeah. Uh, a lot of their mining is coming back on production and shut down coronavirus, but they're going to generate huge profits all prices go higher. Talk about projects like in junior miners that don't generate revenue, but you have projects and these studies like your own have been done on much lower gold prices. And now everything's kind of getting re-rated where a lot of projects, not yours, but other projects for junior miners were uneconomical. And now suddenly they're economical at 1700. So what does higher prices do for you, particularly as a junior miner in gold? Yeah, it, it, you have tremendous leverage as a junior miner to the price of gold. You know, if you go out, you buy just the physical metal itself and gold goes from 1700 to 2500 okay, you doubled your money. You made 100% return. Take our company, US Gold Corp. I mean, we have a project in Wyoming called Copper King. Uh, it's a gold copper uh, deposit, not in mine yet. It's, it's being pushed towards production. So that project, uh, we have a PEA, preliminary economic assessment. At 1275 gold, it has $178 million net present value. It's about 1.8 million gold equivalent ounces. But it's $1,600 gold that we updated recently. That net present value jumps all the way to $321 million. Mm -hmm. So for every $100 rise in the ounce of gold, we get about $44 million more for our NPV. In fact, Frank, we ran the numbers on that at $3,000 gold on that Bank of America call. The NPV of Copper King at $3,000 gold is a billion dollars. 
I mean, our market cap today on the company is $15 million. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, very out of whack. But what will ultimately happen as that metals price, the gold price increases, these projects become more and more economically attractive and viable. Probably at some point, a major or a mid-tier comes in to either take over a project or a company like us because it's, it's just so economic. Yeah, I'm seeing that across the board. So, uh, especially in gold and junior miners across the board, where their projects, as you know, even with biotech, it's the biggest gains go from something that is just a clinical test to after phase one, you get approved for phase one, it's a massive gain. So, you're turning yeah. an asset from nothing into something. That's when you see, you know, with your stock price, it, it goes up tremendously. Uh, yeah. And that's what we're seeing. So, uh, you know, just well positioned. And, I, and yeah. it's great for you guys, US Gold. Now, I guess I'll ask this last question. The S&P 500, very hard to, to predict to the point where, you know, you ask for a target, right? Because it's so heavily weighed towards the fangs. If you throw a Microsoft in there, it's, it's 25, 27% of the whole index. And money continues to flow in these guys. And rightly so. A lot of them are doing well and well positioned for this than industrials or banks. Where do you see this happening? Because I'm in agreement with you. We're overvalued. Uh, for me, I'm playing it long-term conservative put options, but I don't know what's going to happen next month, three months, six months. But I know a year from now, this market is going to make sense where these companies are going to have to put up the numbers to justify yeah. these valuations. And I just don't see that happening with a lot of companies. But what are your thoughts on the market a year from now? Where do you see us? Yeah, look, I, I think it's going to it's going to continue to be choppy. We've seen volatility increase since the beginning of the, the COVID you know, pandemic outbreak, um, thousand point swings in the Dow. I personally think we're probably getting towards a short term peak, you know, maybe mid to end of May. We'll probably go into the summertime doldrums. And I really think test those lows, those March, you know, uh, initial lows. I think we're going to test those in the historic seasonal lows, September, October. Markets tend to bottom in October. And then I think you'll see even more stimulus out of Congress, more stimulus out of the Fed. That will juice the market back up. And a year from now, you know, and let's assume that we get through this, they get a ultimately a uh, vaccination for COVID and we can move towards some normality. I think the U.S. markets will, will be pretty buoyant. They'll probably be back up towards these levels, you know, a year from now. But you're going to have some big volatility, in my opinion, going into that. So it'll be a pretty good market for traders, you know, over the next 12 months. No, it definitely makes sense. Well, well Ed. Thanks so much for the follow-up. I mean, the information you're providing us, U.S., my listeners, uh, from Italy, you're doing this. You're on lockdown. Just to see your economy, I wanted to compare it to our economy because you want a much more stringent lockdown. They really took it seriously. We weren't. It's just amazing to me. I, I'm, a, I'm a person who believes the economy should open up and they should try and just, you know, we have to open up eventually and see. It's going to result in more cases, obviously, letting everyone out of the cage. But just to see where Italy was and learning from you where – uh, you know, you on lockdown before us almost two weeks before, and you're still kind of on lockdown. And we were not really on lockdown to, to, for us to be going back so fast, and you guys are still holding up. It, it, it tells a, 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 a crazy story, doesn't it? Yeah, no, it really does. And you know, the whole world right now, Frank, is a is a forward looking statement because no one knows what's going to happen next week, next month, or next year. But we got to watch this situation closely. How you know how this plays out over the next several weeks and months. And if there's another big super spike of cases, you know, I, I don't think the market's going to like that at all. I hear you. Well, hey, listen, you, your family, we're friends. I've known you for a long time. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Hopefully, you know, you guys are staying safe. You stay safe. And uh, if you ever need anything, just, you know, feel free to give me a shout. I really appreciate you coming on, buddy. Appreciate that, Frank. We look forward to seeing you in person in the not-too-distant future. And you too. All the best. Stay safe. Stay healthy for you and all the viewers. Great. Thanks, man. Great stuff from Ed. Love having him on. Great contact. Very, very smart. Tells it like it is. And it was funny because we ended the interview. We spoke for about 15 minutes after the catch up. And he was like, man, Italy is F, right? The curse word. That's what he said. You know, just as you were talking to one of your friends or whatever. He's like, Italy is, and, you know, dead serious. Uh, he's like, civil unrest is here. He's like, the mafia is planning coordinated riots in the lower income areas. Uh, and he was saying, you know, he hopes that doesn't happen in the U.S., which I'm not sure it won't happen. But it's kind of like I wish we could tape that version. I think there would be a huge demand for people to just, you know, talk as you're talking to your friend, like, holy shit, this thing is effing crazy. But just to, to see that where 
you know, the true you always behave yourself when you're on TV, on media, you're not cursing. I hate that they say cussing. I don't know when cursing turns into cussing. Anyway, that I want people to curse, but it was just you see like the, the, the reaction from him, someone who's has this experience, and he's like, I mean, this is crazy. I mean, there's a big disparity where you know, of course, people in the stock market are going to be doing better, and these are the people that have assets. Uh, but you know, you're looking. Let's go to the U.S. I mean, Wall Street doing great again with stocks going higher. Asset prices are starting to go higher. And the stock market's surging from its lows while Main Street is getting decimated right now. I mean, you know, I'm sure some of you out there don't have jobs that are listening to this. I know a lot of you, almost every one of you know people who are having trouble. I know tons of people who are having trouble right now. I mean, if you're in those industries I mentioned earlier, whether it's industrials, energy, travel, I mean, a lot of these companies just laying off employees, and yeah, they're furloughed, but are they going to bring them back? How long can they pay employees? It's going to be tough. And a lot of these jobs are not going to come back, and maybe some of them do, but you know, I'm hoping. I wish every job came back, but it's not going to be the case. And look at unemployment closing at all-time highs. We talk about more than 50% of the population struggling right now, easily struggling. And probably more than that, they'll lose paycheck to paycheck, and some of them keeping their jobs, but still. You know, not everyone's in the technology sector, in the cloud, and works for Zoom, and works for Amazon, or, or you know, Walmart, which are hiring. I mean, some of these jobs, it's just, I don't know if they're going to come back. I mean, restaurants, bars, it's crazy. So yes, this could certainly lead to, to violence, right? And it's not factoring into stocks at these crazy levels. We've seen it come close at Wall Street and all these movements. You know, I was there. I worked on Wall Street when... We had the credit crisis. I worked on literally on Wall Street, right across the street from the New York Stock Exchange, and it was pretty crazy. People carrying in boxes, getting fired, you know, groups, and just you know, just I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. Right? Every corner, it was like yeah, just people shouting and holding up signs, going to Wall Street. It just it, it, it's. Yeah, and now we've come a long way since that, but it, this looks like it's going to be even worse. Yeah, we're giving money and people checks and stuff like that, but man, you, you can't discount that. I mean, when people really rise up and say enough is enough, I mean, we're, we're, we're broke. We can't pay our bills. You're telling us, you're forcing us to stay home, and now these, these companies that say they were going to hire us back are not going to hire us back. Man, it's a little scary. I hope I'm wrong on that. I, I never said anything like that. There's people out there, it's going to be rights, the dollar's going to crash, end the world. They've been saying it since, you know, you know, 80-year-olds since they woke up and they, they've been 12 been saying it the whole time. It's never happened. But, man, it, it, it's it's a possibility. I'm a common sense person. It, it's a possibility. And Main Street's getting decimated out there. It's pretty crazy. Anyway, let's get to my educational segment real quick. So today's podcast was pretty gloomy. I hate gloomy. I'm more an optimistic person. But I promise, like always, I'm always going to tell you how it is. No agenda. But a positive is that there are Companies and sectors where the coronavirus is leading to surging profits. Whether it's Amazon, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Walmart, a lot of technology companies, all the cloud companies seeing strong growth. Software companies. And you look at the coronavirus and say, wow, these stocks are up tremendously off their lows. They took a dip and now they, they're surging. But when you look at the coronavirus, a lot of this is going to be some of it, and maybe not a lot of it is going to be temporary, right? So you have to understand that some of the companies that you're buying, like for example, there's I believe there's 25 major companies that are searching for a vaccine, right? They're researching for a vaccine. Those are coronavirus plays, right? A lot of them have a premium. Well, as soon as the first one finds that vaccine, it's going to be a massive distribution to spread around what the other 24 companies are going to be left behind, right? You're going to lose that premium. Maybe they come up with other versions. I don't know. I mean, do we have 25 different flu vaccines? No. But the first one that comes up with it, man, it's going to be, and it really works if it works. Again, the quickest we've seen a vaccine come to market is four years. Everybody thinks it's going to come to market in six months. It's not. It's going to be at least 2021. If it's before that, you're nuts if you take it because it probably didn't go through the process of safety, have control groups, which you need. And biotech, these major companies, pharmaceuticals, they understand this. But there's a lot of optimism out there. But either way, once you come out with that vaccine, then the other companies are kind of go back to where they used to trade based on earnings or whatever, sales growth, whatever numbers. So you have to be aware of that because when this risk subsides, and it will, 
a lot of these companies are going to lose the premium. But what you want to look for is companies that are benefiting not just from the coronavirus, but are benefiting from the fundamental shift that we're seeing in business, where more people are working from home than ever. And product, they're not losing productivity. So what does that mean? It's less space in a commercial real estate in, in, that's going to be leased in major cities. I'm thinking about New York. Holy cow. I mean, the amount of money it costs to rent space in New York is incredible. Imagine if you can cut that in half. And a lot of these companies have operations in 40 different cities. So if you could find companies that are not just benefiting from the coronavirus, that are going to benefit long term, maybe like the Zooms. Again, it's trading at a crazy premium. I get it. But those are the companies you really want to focus on. And I'm starting to identify a lot. In fact, one I just recommended for Curzio Research Advisory members, you should have got it already if you're listening to this. And it's a technology company that I found. And what's amazing about this company is that it's trading at 30 times forward earnings, just like the rest of the index, the NASDAQ 100. However, unlike almost every other company in that index, this company is projected to grow earnings by 35% plus. And that's 35% plus, not just this year, but annually over the next two years. It's seeing massive growth, massive people sign up to the platform. These are the companies you want to buy because 30 times forward earnings, when I say that, this is it's a crazy, crazy expensive if you just look at it on a standalone basis. And the reason why the market's so expensive is because it's okay to trade at 30 times forward earnings if you're growing earnings considerably, more than 15, 20%. That's fine. We've seen Apple, we've seen Netflix, we've seen Chipotle trading at these levels where they keep hitting highs because they're growing. What scares the shit out of me with this market is earnings are not growing. And yet prices are going higher for a lot of these companies. So this company I recommend, I'm not going to give it away, but it's not just the only company I've found. It's like three or four of them that are really digging into that are growing earnings considerably, which really got help from the coronavirus because we're in the technology sector. But it's they're also going to benefit from the permanent shift that we're going to see in people working from home. And not only that, it, it's older people. I mean, now you, older people or pregnant women or you know, anyone who has respiratory diseases, I mean, they're not going to go, they're going to be working from home. How do you say if you're their boss, you got to come into work? No way. If they die, man, that's on you. Especially since all the technology we have, we have you know, faster internet, we have access to everything, cloud, get on you know, anything you want. And my whole staff already is mobile, and we get it done. But as we get bigger, I think we're going to have to really have a core office where we have our marketing team there and things like that. But we have calls a lot. We have Zoom calls, calls every week, talking to them a lot. And we make it work here. This is before coronavirus. So a lot of companies are starting to realize that, where if we had everyone that they had to work in northern Florida, I'd probably lose half of my staff because I don't think anybody really wants to live. A lot of people don't like Florida. So these are the companies that you want to look at that it's okay if it's trading at 25 times forward earnings, like it's more than 150 companies right now in the SP 500 trading higher than 25 times forward earnings. And I have to say out of all those companies, I would say about 75% of them are seeing earnings slow considerably. Okay, that's dangerous. If you have companies that are growing, you can trade at 40 times forward earnings. That's fine. If you're growing those earnings, project to grow those earnings at 25%, 30%, that stock is actually cheap. And you have to understand, it took me a long time for having a fundamental background from my dad to understand that. That's the education I got from Kramer, and it's made my investors and me a lot of money over the years. Because there's value investors that would never touch any of the technology stocks, and look how high the FANG companies are. And they were expensive forever. They've been expensive forever because they're growing. So you want to look at companies that are growing. Make sure you that if you're going to invest in companies that have expensive valuations, which is across the board right now, most companies, make sure that they're growing earnings. That's the advice I'm going to give you my educational segment. CRA members have that pick. Again, it's a very, very low price newsletter. If you want to subscribe, you can go to a website. If not, it's okay. If you want to just listen to free stuff, that's fine. But this pick is definitely worth it. I like it a lot. And I think it's an easy double inside 24 to 36 months, probably more like 24 months. And you'll see why after you watch my video, which I provide a nice 20 minute awesome video for my subscribers. I've been doing video updates to get things out to you quicker for my newsletters, which I don't think anyone's doing. I see them do updates, but this is a full issue. And also we have the write up of the stock, which we're doing for both 
Curzio Research Advisory and Curzio Venture Opportunities to get picks out to you quicker because the market is more volatile than ever. Okay, guys, a lot to digest in this podcast. Thank you, Ed Carr, for coming on. If you want to find out more information from me, tweet me, at Frank Curzio. Uh, I, I do live videos once a day, two, three-minute videos, just updates on the market, pretty cool, but it is live, so have fun with it, and I can make mistakes or whatever, but they're getting thousands of page views, which is awesome. Thank you so much. And a lot of those get posted also to our Curzio Research YouTube page. If you want to subscribe, if you subscribe, you're going to get all of our content. It's not just interviews, a lot of interviews I'm doing uh, with video, uh, but I am going to be doing more media appearances. I just started. You're going to see all that. Even when I'm speaking at conferences, all, everyone that, that runs these conferences tapes these things, and you know everyone who speaks gets their uh, it gets a little file. All this stuff's going to be posted, and every time we post something, it's automatically going to be sent to you. It's really good stuff. It's not you know, advertisements or anything. This is just pure like research ideas, lots of fun stuff. So if you want to go and look at my ugly face, you could do so instead of listening to the podcast, but you could do that at Crazy Research YouTube page. So guys, thanks so much for listening. Be careful out there. It is a dangerous market. When navigating well, we do good in the portfolios. Still be very, very careful, guys. A lot of risk out there. Really appreciate all your support. I'll see you in seven days. Take care. The information presented on Wall Street Unplugged is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decision solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility. Wall Street Unplugged, produced by the Choose Yourself Podcast Network, the leader in podcasts produced to help you choose yourself.